So let me uh, start with the outline. What I would like, even though I know it's been covered a little bit this morning and in some of the talks, is to start with the introduction to high power lasers, high intensity lasers. Go a little bit about what is currently available today. What are these facilities operating today? Uh, and then move on to how we're going to uh, increase the average powers of high power lasers. And then focusing a little bit on uh, specifically on the work that we've been doing uh, in STFC. So let me start with this map. Uh, this is a map that is generated every two years uh, by the EQL committee. And if you had seen this map a few years ago, actually you could see three or four points. Uh, but on the last uh, few years, the number of uh, what we call ultra uh, intense lasers is really exploded. I mean, you can see there that it's just a really growing uh, field. And it would be impossible for me to really, in this in 30 minutes, to go through all the different technology that people are, um, are employing. But it's just to highlight uh, that it's, it's a growing activity. Just as a basic reminder of what we call a high power laser, is basically we want to deliver a modest amount of energy uh, from the uh, to even a kilojoule in a relatively short pulse. Uh, and again, it could be from 20 femtoseconds to 100 picoseconds. And of course, this gives us you know, decent amount of powers, but more importantly, we want to, f to focus it down to a very small spot to achieve uh, high intensities, typically 10 to the 21. And as you have seen today many times, again, when we focus down this laser, of course, we can achieve extreme conditions, and this will give rise fundamentally to secondary sources, electrons, protons, x-rays. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about how, how we got there. So the laser was invented in 1960, and uh, very quickly it was understood that we really needed to uh, start producing short pulses, and uh, different techniques came along. The Q-switching allowed us to go to nanosecond pulses, the more lock-in, uh, but more recently, oops, sorry, more recently, the chair pulse amplification is the one that allows us to really go to much shorter pulses and therefore high peak powers. So in the, in the 19s, we started seeing uh, uh, systems being able to deliver a petawatt. And what's happened over the last decade is that there has been a lot of petawatt systems coming online. Um, really quite, and if you look at the first map that we were looking at the beginning, uh, many of them are 200 to the uh, 200 terawatts to the petawatt level. And the current activity now is to, to reach, uh, you know, to increase the peak power that we can deliver to move to the 10 petawatt. So let's gonna have a, a little look. So. How can we do that? This is the basic schematic of a laser. Um, and I think it's important to go through it, such as we understand how the laser technology is being developed. So basically, to get a, a, a short pulse at the end, we need to start with a very short pulse. We need to stretch it in time to avoid damage. We will choose a material that we are uh, going amplify our, our, um, to amplify our pulse. Of course, the laser material needs to be pumped by a pump laser, and then we will compress it in time, achieving this pink power. But it is this combination, is the combination of what you choose as the game material, is the combination of, of your pump that will, really will determine a lot of your properties. It will determine the energy that you can extract, it will determine the pulse length that you can deliver, and the repatriation rate that you can operate this laser at. A lot of people also forget that at the end you need to make your, uh, make your, short, your pulse very short, and this is still the last one of the last optics that you use, the compressor grating, can limit, in some cases, the performance of the short pulse. If I look at um, the typical uh, technology that has been using lasers, we started with neodymium glass. Neodymium glass is a material. It's one of the first materials that was used in short pulse lasers. It's very easy to manufacture. It can be grow to very large apertures. Um, easy to, to uh, pump with a flash lamp directly. And in the past, it's delivered relatively long pulses, although there has been recent developments to, to be able to use a neodymium glass to deliver a slightly shorter pulses. Typically, they've been fired every half an hour, one shot, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, it depends on the energy, but uh, every half an hour, one shot an hour, three shots a day, depending on the energy we want to extract. But again, recent developments have allowed us to cool the material and fire it much faster. A little bit later on then came along Thai Sapphire. Thai Sapphire is a different system that allows us to go straight away to shorter pulses. 
uh, and that's because it can keep the bandwidth during amplification, and also it can be it's pumped not directly with pulse lamp, but it requires a pump laser that can be diode pump or flash lamp. Um, and for a while, it was limited in terms of the energy that you can extract. It was limited by the crystal size, but it has been developing, so how big the crystals can be. And, and emerging technology is the OPCPA that requires uh, nonlinear crystals like uh, DKDP. Again, uh, this, there aren't so many systems using the, this te uh, technique, uh, but it has the potential of delivering very high energies and very, very short pulses. So let me give you three examples. Uh, many of these examples you've seen today, uh, Bella in America, a uh, petable laser operating at one hertz, given uh, energies, so, you know, the range of uh, 30 to 40 joules at 35 seconds. Uh, the one in the UK, the Gemini facility now we have uh, is a dual beam. It has two beams operating at half a petabot each, again, uh, delivering modest energies, 15 joules in 35 seconds, achieving uh, relatively nice intensities, 10 to 21. And uh, if you go to Asia, again, there is another petawatt laser. They claim that they've delivered about four petawatt um, uh, with relatively short pulses. Now, all these, three in, all these three facilities can be used for electron acceleration. Uh, Bella is totally dedicated to the electron acceleration program. In Gemini, 70% of the program is electron acceleration. And uh, in APRI, they do both uh, solids and electron acceleration experiments. So what's in the horizon? Again, I've chosen three, three uh, facilities, very differently, but all increasing the peak power. So these, these elements now, the, the, we have um, L4 in the Czech Republic, LA beamlines. They are aiming for really quite a lot of energy, delivering in a sort of 150 femtoseconds. They are using uh, neodymium glass, and as I said before, neodymium glass now, uh, ha the, a lot of development has been done in order to use different types of glass that allows us to keep the bandwidth, such as then we can, instead of having a 500 uh, femtosecond pulse, we can go down to 150 femtosecond. Um, the short rate now, instead of being a short uh, every 20 minutes, it's a shorter minute. Again, they have changed the geometry, the traditional geometry of a laser amplifier to be able to cool the material in a way that allows us now to fire a fast, faster repetition rate. A pollen in France is coming up between ten, five to 10 petawatt uh, and with a shorter pulse, 15 femtoseconds again, try to fire a shorter minute. It's a Thai sapphire system uh, pumped by um, uh, uh, flash lamp uh, pump lasers. And then here again, in um, using another Thai sapphire uh, system, is LIMP. Now we have two beams operating at 10 petawatt, uh, delivering uh, pulses on the order of 20 femtoseconds or the order 200 joules, but again, to short a minute. So we have seen now how we have been able to work, working on laser technology, really gone to higher peak powers. But let me show you a different thing. Now, for, let's not forget for a little bit the peak power. If I just look at the energy that is the river, looking at the repetition rate, what we can see is that um, some of the older systems that we have, for example, in, um, in the UK, a Vulcan, in Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, a petable laser, but it fires uh, it's a neodymium glass system and it fires every half an hour. As technology has been developed, you can see that what we have been trying to do is as well as increasing the peak power, is try to fire a little bit faster. So Gemini and Bella, they are firing every 20 seconds, every minute, every uh, at one hertz. Some of the upcoming facilities, again, they are trying to move in this direction. Um, so all these facilities, they all share something in common, and is that all either directly, they are directly pumped by flash lamps, or they are pumped by lasers that are built with flash lamps. So let me just go, so what, what, what do I mean by that? So we can choose a laser material. I, I explained to you that we can choose, for example, near human glass, or we can choose that sapphire, but we can also choose whether we use flash lamps or we use diodes. Now, laser technology started with flash lamps. Why? Because they were easy to manufacture, they were reliable, easy to assemble, they were cheap. But, uh, you know, uh, they are not efficient. A lot of the energy from a flash lamp gets absorbed in heat. Then you have to cool the amplifier down. 
Um, so it's got some draw drawbacks. So in the last uh, decade, few decades, a lot of people have started working on diodes. Now here, they are not so easy to manufacture. Uh, you have bars that they have to assemble into stacks. They are t stacks into arrays. They are very efficient, but they are a little bit more expensive. But fundamentally, we do gain something. And what we get is that if I looked at the systems that are dependent on flash lamps, they are pushing the average, you know, the repetition rate. They are pushing it towards the one to 10 hertz. They are pushing it, okay? But the starting point for diode pump systems really starts on the one to 10 hertz area. And the, I've put here a couple of examples. I could put a lot more, but then you wouldn't be able to see. Uh, I've chosen maybe uh, conveniently the systems that we develop in the centralized facility, the dipole that is able to deliver in terms of energy per pulse, uh, 10 joules at uh, uh, 10 hertz, and then we upgrade it to deliver a system to highest, delivering 100 joules at 10 hertz. And also more recently, the system developed uh, for Eli uh, L3 by Lawrence Livermore. Um, and let me show you that one, because this is, this is one of the systems that really has it all at the moment, and you can see it delivers the peak power, and it's able to deliver one petawatt, but more fundamentally, operating at 10 hertz, and why? Because now this system, even though it's, it's based on Thai sapphire as the amplifier, is, used, is using a diode pump as, uh, pump as the pump rather than flash lamps. So... In terms of the deep cell technology, the diode pump technology that we have developed in the CLF, um, we have, as I said, we, uh, in the map, we have developed uh, a system that is capable of delivering 100 joules at 10 hertz for high -less. It operates, it was optimized for two to 10 nanoseconds. And this system was built and, demos, uh, uh, and demonstrated the performance and is all already operating in high -less in the Czech Republic. Uh, a second system is under construction. The system is, is a photocopy of the system that deliver, delivered to high lace. It will go on the high energy density hatch in Exfel. It will be is on the final commission in the stages in Rutherford. And it, it is expected that it will move towards the end of 2018. It will be delivered to Exfel. This now will is a long pulse system that will be as, uh, used together with actually a short pulse system and the Exfel beam. So what, that, what route have we, how, how have we achieved this, this high average power? So we, in, in the CLF, we decided to go with a, a concept that is very is similar to one developed by the Americans in Mercury, by which we have a material that is going to be phase cooled. So in our, in our case, we have chosen ethereum Yagis labs. These ethereum Yagis labs are cooled by a gas that uh, is helium gas that is cool at 150K, and they get pump on that's on this side by a 940 nanometers pump, and we get it structured in the same direction, and it operates at uh, 1030. So uh, that's the heart of an amplifier. The actual amplifier, uh, that actual laser system has got two, two sets of amplifiers. It's got one at 10 joule and the 100 joule level. So we start with a pulse that is nanojoules of energy. It gets injected there. It's a long pulse. It can be temporarily shaped. It gets injected then into the 10 joule amplifier and then into the 100 joule amplifier and out it comes. Uh, we have, when we designed this laser, we were, it was the first time that we had this, signed this type of uh, system. So you always want to have like a safety margin. You don't just design a laser uh, to, you know, without any safety margin. So what we realized that, of course, in designing this, that dipole, with a few changes, is actually capable of delivering a lot more energy. So in dipole, we can push the energy output uh, from the 100 joules to 150 joules using the spare diode and cooling capacity. Of course, we really need to look at uh, the game media and uh, a little bit in, the, in terms of the geometry and the, uh, uh, and the cladding of the game media. And we need to look at the objects that we use in the system to make sure that we don't damage it. Um, and ideally then, what we would like to also do is to convert it to the uh, second harmonic. Uh, and for that, we need to get uh, crystals. We have done some tests using LBO crystals. This is 
uh, a small crystal that we use uh, with a 10 joule head. But what it proved very uh, conveniently is that we can achieve 80% uh, conversion. So why have we put so much effort in developing this technology? And that's because, of course, now that we have a beautiful pump uh, uh, that can operate uh, more than 100 joules uh, at um, 10 hertz, we can use it to, cr to have both a, a petawatt system that can operate at uh, 10 hertz. So in here we have, if you remember from the beginning, I had my short poles uh, front end. It was a stretch and then it got amplified in a tie sapphire. Now my tie sapphire amplifier is gonna be pumped by dipole that has been frequency doubling and then I'll compress it and then I'll have a petawatt system operating at 10 hertz, not dissimilar to what L3 in Lawrence Lurie Moore is doing. We have, uh, we have submitted this proposal for funding. So what we would like to do at the CLF is, having, uh, is have a new facility. Uh, we have Gemini, uh, uh, but a new facility that would house this one petawatt system. Uh, and we've called it, uh, we've called it the uh, Extreme Photonics Application Center. The idea of this center is that it's not just available to the scientific community. Uh, Gemini has, is our facility has been focused in uh, delivering to almost 95% of its program to the academic community. In here, we have heard today that when you focus on high power lasers, it produces a lot of secondary sources that can be used for many applications. Recognizing that these high power lasers, uh, when they are operating at higher um, repetition rates are very useful for different applications to industry, we have submitted this bit. So the idea here would be that industry wanting to use lasers and academics wanting to use these high power lasers would both share the access to this facility. And this is uh, waiting for funding. But of course, this would take us to the next five, six years. And I said, uh, what, what is round the corner? Well, round the corner is that in laser technology, you can never stop. You can never say 10 hertz is enough. So if 10 hertz is enough, what is the next line? The next line is, can we deliver 100 hertz? Um, and how do you start? Well, when we started um, increasing the repetition rate, we started with 10 joules. So we decided to aim at the same prototype, to de de develop a prototype delivering a modest amount of energy at 10, 10 joules, but that is now operating at 10 hertz. And now we want to keep it the same, the same uh, footprint as the current system. Uh, but of course you have a lot more heat. Uh, so you need to look at uh, how do you uh, cope with the heat in the game media? How do you cool it? How do you uh, deal with the different optics such as they don't manage? What diets you use? And we've looked at it and actually it is not that difficult. We can optimize the size of the game media, the cladding around it. We can look in at changing the way we cool the game media and it's actually possible. So we're working on it. This is just to give you some examples that again, if you look at uh, the game media uh, in terms of the heat, uh, I, if, you, if we have 10 joules and now we increase the repetition rate, uh, the temperatures are far too high. So while we, we look at, for example, different solutions, which is bigger this with wider cladding um, and is uh, changing the way that we are cooling now and now the temperatures become manageable. Um, and again, we want to go to as, as smaller systems as possible. So as well as looking at if you, we can cool the game media, our game, um, the way that we cool our game media requires large, some of these large tanks. So we are looking at more innovative solutions that make the whole thing compact. And the point of this is that in future years, what you want to have, if you want to have lasers that are smaller and smaller, such as they become portable. Uh, so at this moment, uh, we identify what are some of the big things that are making uh, these laser systems a little bit more difficult to move around. And this is, one of, this is one of the examples. And I would like to finish with something that we don't do in the CLF, but that it, it, it is uh, really uh, taken, you know, a lot of interest for other people, which is fibers. I mean, fibers, uh, we are in a different regime now. We have really, really, really high uh, average powers, but of course, 
um, the energy bill policy is, is very different. But it's just to show you that if simplicity is what you want, of course, and you're not bothered about any other factors, fibers can, uh, you can have a CPA system all drawn in one line. But of course, in all, uh, there are limitations. When you go to increasing the pulse energies, you end up with uh, damages, the nonlinear effects, uh, can, uh, can damage the, you know, doesn't allow you to propagate some of these uh, high energy pulses, and also you can have damage in the fibers. But people are very clever, and they, some people are working in how you can coherently combine some of these fibers. Now, it's an approach that uh, other people are working on, uh, but clearly, you know, it is, it would require to have thousands of fibers in order to get to the dual level. So even though a single system is really quite simple, uh, you need to think about how you then transport all those fibers um, that you need to combine together. So in summary, I just hope I've given you, I've given you a good overview of what are the current systems uh, uh, that we are going to see. Uh,